the delights of Europe are captivating, bewitching, and intoxicating. History, art, architecture, food, and people all culminate in a delight for the senses and a revelry for the mind. In November of 2019, my wife and I took a Mediterranean cruise and we brought along our 18-month-old daughter, Genevieve. And now, I'm inviting you to join us. Along with my parents, we'll take a multi-generational sojourn through the broad avenues in Barcelona and cramped alleyways of Naples. We'll admire the opulence of a Parisian opera house, get a bird's eye view of Florence, and we'll have our breath taken away by incredible landscapes you have to see to believe. We take a step back in history, all while embracing the moment. Join me as we embark on a journey that none of us will soon forget. begins in Barcelona. We fly in a couple days early so we have some time to enjoy a little of what Barcelona has to offer, including Las Ramblas, the Barri Gotique, and of course, La Sagrada Familia. We then embark on our seven-night Mediterranean voyage on board the Norwegian Epic. Our first stop is Naples, where we'll wander through streets covered in graffiti and enjoy a slice of pizza in its birthplace. From there, we have a whirlwind of a day in Rome, complete with a jogging tour of the Vatican Museums. Our final stop in Italy is my personal favorite, Florence, the city of da Vinci and the Medici, of David and Brunelleschi, whose famous dome we climb to the top of for a bird's eye view of the city. We then make our way to France for a stop in Nice and Cannes to revel in the beauty of the Côte d'Azur, where we visit a thriving farmer's market and walk along the dazzling waterfront promenade. And the final port on our cruise is a quick stop in Palma de Mallorca, a small island off the coast of Spain, often referred to as the Pearl of the Mediterranean. We cap our trip off with three nights in Paris because, as the old saying goes, Paris is always a good idea. While in Paris, we'll visit the Opera Garnier, take a late night river cruise along the Seine, walk to the top of the Arc de Triomphe, take in some antiquities in the world's largest museum, the Louvre, and end our trip with a ride to the top of the Eiffel Tower. So we land in Barcelona, and we make our way to the little apartment we're renting for the next two nights. It's a great little place just steps from Las Ramblas. Las Ramblas is a beautiful, tree-lined, broad avenue with vendors of all shapes and kinds. It stretches from Plaza de Catalunya at one end all the way to the waterfront. 
Las Ramblas calls tourists to slowly shuffle along its long, flat promenade, passing by flower stalls, souvenir kiosks, restaurants, and even some actual historical monuments like the Teatro Principal, Barcelona's oldest theater, and the Columbus Monument, which you can actually head to the top of for some amazing views. In my humble opinion, no trip to Barcelona would be considered complete without a visit to La Sagrada Familia. La Sagrada Familia has been under construction for over 130 years. In 1882, the first stones were laid, but after the initial architect of Sagrada Familia had some artistic differences, modernist architect Antony Gaudí took over the project. Gaudi worked on the project until his untimely death in 1926, the result of an accident when he was hit by a trail. Over 130 years later, there is finally an ending in sight, 2026, on the 100th anniversary of Gaudi's death. Gaudi replaced the classic neo-Gothic plan with a modern one, one more daring, one far more grand. This massive place of worship is full of symbolism inside and out. On the eastern side, where most tourists enter, is the Nativity facade. It depicts the birth of Jesus in incredible detail, juxtaposed with an overt theme of nature. The scenes seem to grow and emerge organically out of the stone. Animals, trees, and all variations of nature surround the scene because, as Gaudi said, there are no straight lines or sharp corners in nature. Therefore, buildings must have no straight lines or sharp corners. This side of the church holds the most steadfast to Gaudi's original vision of La Sagrada Familia, earthy, organic, and full of life. Now contrast that with the opposite side of the church, which depicts the Passion. Stark lines, smooth stone, and barren scenes are the opposite of the lush scenery overflowing with life on the nativity side. Here you'll find angular, harsh faces. Sadness, grief, and despair are obvious on the faces of the mourners. What's amazing is that these two facades, as entrancing as they are, are actually only side entrances. When completed, the main entrance will be at the end in a yet-to-be-constructed entryway. The interior of Sagrada Familia has come a long way in a short time. Only 20 years ago, one could only skirt around the edges behind ropes. Now, tourists have full reign of the nave. That is, when a service is not going on. In keeping with the theme of nature, the immense towering columns are meant to look like tree trunks, complete with a canopy of leaves overhead. What makes Sagrada Familia stand out to me among all the other churches in Europe, besides of course its massive scale and stonework, is the stained glass. Gargantuan walls of bright colors are found along both sides of the nave. Worshippers and tourists alike are bathed in a symphony of glorious color from all angles, a far cry from the somewhat drab and somber atmosphere of Gothic and medieval churches of this scale. Throughout the day, the colors change as light streams in through the windows, casting beautiful hues of red, green, blue, and yellow. When completed, La Sagrada Familia will have the tallest steeple in the world. To give you an idea of how tall that will be, the four current spires are 330 feet tall, and when completed, the tallest spire, the Jesus Spire, will climb a staggering 560 feet into the air.
After exploring the church itself, take some time to wander through the attached museum. Here you can learn some history of the church, find workshops with scale models, and see some of the memorabilia gathered throughout the life of this still incomplete church. After spending two nights in Barcelona, we have now embarked on our seven-night Mediterranean cruise. Our first three stops are in Italy. We'll spend a day wandering the streets of Naples in search of great pizza in its birthplace, before heading off on a whirlwind tour of Rome and the Vatican. Our final stop in Italy is the birthplace of the Renaissance, Florence, where we'll climb to the top of Brunelleschi's dome and hang out with my good friend, Dave. Detractors will try and tell you that Naples is not even Italy. They'll tell you not to come here, that you'll get pickpocketed or scammed or both, and all that may be true, but it could just be their fear of what may be the truth. That Naples is, in some ways, the most quintessentially Italian place you'll ever visit. And while the gritty roads dingy alleyways and graffitied streets do indeed stand in stark contrast to most other places you'll visit in Italy. For better or worse, Napoli is southern Italy's leading city. It's vibrant and heart-stopping, and yeah, maybe there's trash piled in the streets, and maybe you might definitely get pickpocketed, but never forget. This is where pizza came from, so it can't be all bad, right? Just a hop, skip, and a jump from Mount Vesuvius, Naples is in itself an attraction to be seen. There are sights, of course, but Naples is the top attraction. The streets, the Vespas, the grind of the city get lost wandering around. It is a place where anyone can get an education. Take in the balconies with laundry, walk into a centuries-old church, and maybe, if you're lucky, stumble upon a bit of art from a little-known up-and-comer, Banksy. Naples is a lot of things. It's old-world Italy. It's faded, it's shabby and seedy, but it's vibrant and colorful and exciting. But more than anything, it is, in its own way, beautiful. I grew up with foreign exchange students. We had them and they would come live with us for an entire school year and they were from all over. And it was such a cool experience because now I feel like I have brothers and sisters in Brazil and Italy and France and all these amazing places in Spain. So it was such a cool thing to have growing up. Like I said, one of them was from Italy, Fabrizio. So I asked Fabrizio, what do you think of Naples? He said, wash them, wash them, wash them with the fire, ooh, Vesuvius, wash them with the fire. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't think he's the biggest fan of Naples. <laughs> One of the best parts about our stop in Naples is that once we get off the ship, we are already in the heart of town. A few steps off the ship, and we board our hop-on, hop-off tour bus. Listening to the yacht tour. I think it's a plus. Gigi, put it in your ear. Put it in your ear. Good job. Okay, I have to admit that I am not normally the biggest fan of the hop-on, hop-off bus tour, but I do see the merits. If you're trying to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time, get all the sites checked off your mental checklist, then it's a fine way of getting the overview of a city. 
Personally, I would much rather be down on the streets, walking around and getting the feel of a place, but on a cruise, one already has such a short amount of time in each port that a bus tour can be an economical way to see a lot of the city in one fell swoop. But the most important thing to keep in mind, don't forget about the hop off portion of your hop on hop off bus tour. Don't just sit in your ivory tower on the second floor of your mobile conveyance looking down your nose at the plebeians below. Get off the bus and immerse yourself in the city. Even if that just means stopping off for a coffee. After all, the story of you getting into a farcical conundrum caused by a misunderstanding from a language barrier but ultimately having a new Italian best friend is a much better story to rub in the noses of your family and friends back home than on our bus tour we saw this one church go by at 15 miles an hour. Get off the bus, find a place that seems like it may just be off the tourist path, and walk in. Properly caffeinated once again, it's time to set off on our walk of the city. I've said it before and I will say it again, getting out on the ground level is the best way to get to know a new city. And it seems that Gigi would agree. We relish our afternoon passeggiata, taking our time, stopping whenever something catches our fancy. We pass through grand galleries, dart down narrow alleyways, and saunter alongside buildings dating back centuries. Piazza Dante, a large open public square, is something of an anomaly in a city known for its lack of elbow room. Looming over the center of the piazza is a statue of the poet Dante Alighieri, the Florentine-born writer of the Divine Comedy and the namesake of Piazza Dante. From there, we make our way down the tree-lined streets to the Duomo di Napoli, the Naples Cathedral, a Roman Catholic church dating back to the 13th century. This imposing cathedral has seen its share of hardships through the centuries. It survived an earthquake in the early 1400s, bombings, and it has been rebuilt several times, resulting in a patchwork of architectural styles. Gothic, Baroque, and Neo-Gothic elements fuse together harmoniously and escalate rather than detract from the beauty of this church. The interior is embellished with elaborate frescoes, ornate ceilings, and an absolutely stunning altar. Ooh, all this walking is making me hungry. I wonder, do they have any good food in Naples? Maybe a signature dish of some kind? Something like, oh, I don't know, a round piece of dough that's topped with tomatoes, cheese, and basil? So we're walking through Naples and we find this place called Dal Presidente Pizza. And I guess during the summer months, it can have a line just around the block. Like it was, it would be a huge long line during the busy months, but we got really lucky and we walked right in. One of the benefits of traveling in November. This place has been serving up wood-fired pizza according to the ancient Neapolitan tradition for nearly a century. Supposedly, um, the pizza was invented in Naples and the original pizza was a margarita pizza, like it is now. So, went in Naples. I was reading that it takes two to three years to become a master pizza maker and it's all about the dough. The dough has to rise 10 to 15 hours overnight. Oh man. I can't wait to dive in. That was actually the last footage I have of the pizza place, and so I can only assume that I didn't film anything after that because I was in such a state of pizza ecstasy that I just couldn't even think straight. Which is part of the reason that I'm not even sure if what happens next actually even happened. I wouldn't believe it if I didn't have footage. <laughs> We left Del Presidente Pizza, trying to avoid getting run over by Vespas, and we sort of turn the corner and we're in this little narrow alleyway. And there's some beautiful statues of angels everywhere, because Italy, and I look on the wall, and there's this painting of an angel, and it's covered in glass, which is interesting because there's graffiti all over in Naples, but this was like covered up like it was like something special. So I'm kind of looking at it, and I look down, and on the wall, there is a plaque that says Banksy. <laughs> There's a Banksy on the side of Dal Presidente Pizza. How cool is that?
take us back to the uh, the port, and of course, it starts raining. So it's pouring down rain. Seems appropriate though, somehow. We're all hidden underneath this awning here. My most important message is this. Don't let people convince you not to go to Naples. Although I didn't get to spend much time here, I would be lying if I said I didn't want to go back. And so therefore, until next time. Our second stop in Italy is the Eternal City, Rome. What in the world can I possibly say about Rome that hasn't been said by millions of people before me in a million different ways? It's beautiful. It's ancient. It's a modern city littered with some of the greatest ruins and antiquities on Earth. Now, I'm sure all that's true, but I can't testify to that because it all went by in such a blur. Somehow, in just a few short hours, we saw the Circus Maximus, followed by a swift photo op of the Colosseum. We then went to the country within the country, Vatican City, where we jogged a 5K through the Vatican Museums and tried to fathom the scale of St. Peter's Basilica, the largest church in the world and home to the Roman Catholic faith. Now, don't get me wrong, it was all astonishing, but it went by so quickly, I nearly got whiplash. Luckily, I took tons of footage, so I'll take care of the cardio, and you can sit back and relax as we rapid-fire tour one of the greatest cities on Earth, Rome. Okay, so I got to thinking about it, and there are a lot of phrases that we use all the time that have to do with Rome. So we've got, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. All roads lead to Rome. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And another one, Rome wasn't built in a day. Now, what was interesting is our tour guide actually had a slight variation on that. See if you can spot the difference here. Uh, she said, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it can be seen in a day as long as you run as fast as you can for seven hours straight. It's not quite as catchy. Our first stop of the day is the Circus Maximus, an ancient chariot racing course which we really only get a passing glance of as we walk towards the Colosseum. Nowadays, there's not much left of it, but in its day, this was a massive stadium, much more colossal than the Colosseum, ironically. It held 250,000 spectators compared to the Colosseum's 50,000. It was also built hundreds of years earlier, which is why it is sometimes referred to as the Colosseum's Big Brother. It's mostly a vast open field now, but it's fun to imagine the ancient Romans walking these same streets in the other direction, heading towards a day's entertainment at this archaic arena. But we're off to see the relative new kid on the block, the Roman Colosseum. As we approach the Colosseum, we are first greeted by the imposing Arch of Constantine, a massive monument celebrating the military coup that resulted in Constantine being the sole emperor of Rome. But we all know why we're really here. To stand, or in Genevieve's case, toddle, in front of the glory of the Colosseum. This is the Rome of our collective imagination. This is the Rome we see adorning the walls of our neighborhood Italian restaurant. When we close our eyes and imagine ourselves on a Vespa, zooming through the streets of Rome, isn't the Colosseum the inevitable backdrop of our scene? It's the picture postcard ready-made monument full of history and intrigue, where gladiators would enter the ring and face unimaginable battles against both man and beast. If I listen closely, I can still hear the roar of the lion. Oh. Wait, no, that's just my stomach. When are we doing lunch again? Okay, so we're going to see the Vatican. Now, now, let me try and paint a picture here. The Vatican is the world's smallest country, but there is a lot to see. It has the Vatican Museums, which has approximately 20,000 works on display with over four miles of hallways. It has Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and St. Peter's Basilica, which, if you don't know, is the largest church in the world. One could take days or even weeks to see everything here. But to see all of this, we had about 45 minutes. 
So needless to say, we were on a bit of a time crunch. Here we are, surrounded by one of the greatest collections of art in Western civilization, and it's all passing by us at breakneck speeds. As we jog, the best we can muster is, ooh, there's a statue. Would you look at that tapestry? Oh, did you see that ceiling? Very nice painting. Okay, what's next? It was the most beautiful way in the world to get whiplash. I could have spent weeks wandering around, scrutinizing the statues, pondering the paintings, taking in the tapestries, reflecting on the frescoes in this world-class, incomparable museum. But as I am often fond of saying, I guess we'll just have to come back. After we were all awarded our 5k medals, the tour culminates here, the entrance to St. Peter's Basilica. It is a bit ironic that St. Peter's Basilica is the largest church in the world, given the fact that it is found in the smallest country in the world, Vatican City. It's impossible to put into words how one feels walking into St. Peter's, religion aside. Catholics will come here to worship, but everyone can admire the vast scale and intricate details that make up this church, with contributions from some of the greatest artists of all time, with names like Michelangelo, Bernini, and Raphael. Time travel is not an easy feat, but I do believe it can be done. I'm sure there's many ways of doing it, but there's only one surefire way that I know of, and it's here. In a town I consider to be one of the best in all of Italy, and even all of Europe. As long as you know where to go. Enter here, the Santa Maria del Fiore Cathedral, better known as the Duomo. Climb the 463 stone steps, past Vasari's frescoes of the Last Judgment, through the seemingly never-ending narrow passageways, and finally emerge at the top of Brunelleschi's dome. From here, you have a bird's eye view of what was the epicenter of the Renaissance. If you try hard enough, you can find yourself in the year 1400. Now, don't get me wrong, the city of Florence looks quite a bit different now. A lot can change in 600 years. But from all the way up here, you can feel the weight of this city. As you stare out, you remember that this is the realm of Michelangelo, Machiavelli, the Medici, and Leonardo da Vinci. They walked these very same streets. This is the home of David, and if you close your eyes, you can almost hear Michelangelo chipping away at marble even now. This is where we find the roots of our modern world. This is Florence.
So whenever I tell people what I do, the most common question I always get is then what is your favorite place you've ever traveled? And my go-to answer for a long time now has been Florence. I don't know what it was about this city, but it had this magical feel to it. Like I just absolutely fell in love with it from the moment we got there to the moment we left. I just, I want to go back there and I want to spend a month there. It's just, it was so walkable and friendly and it had I don't know, just this like electric atmosphere. And it was just magical. I absolutely fell in love with it. And we were only there for like three hours. <laughs> we're on our way to the top. It actually didn't take very long. I think they yeah, had like closed the doors or something. Yeah. But now they reopened them and we got in pretty quickly. We had a reservation time, which helped. We've got to skip some people too. So make sure to have a reservation. Construction of the Duomo Cathedral first began in 1296, and Florentines always knew they wanted a giant dome on the top of this massive cathedral. There was only one problem. They didn't have the know-how to build a dome. For over a century, there was a giant hole in the middle of the roof, waiting until the engineering feat could be accomplished. Enter Filippo Brunelleschi, who constructed a dome within a dome. The inner dome, now painted with Vasari's Last Judgment, and the red outer dome, now the symbol of Florence. Construction of the dome began in 1420 and was finished in 1436. Those travelers brave enough to conquer the 463 steps, scuttle through the narrow stone passageways, and defy their fear of heights are rewarded with one of the best views in all of Italy. Wow, we made it to the top. This is, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Down to street level. That's where we were though. All the way up there. Ah, oh, this is... It's so beautiful. And it stopped raining. Yeah, and Yay. What a great day. <laughs> the dome is certainly the most recognizable and most impressive feature of the cathedral, but take some time to walk around the whole place. The rather busy facade of the cathedral is clad in three colors of Tuscan marble, green, pink, and white. This was not completed until 1887, nearly 600 years after construction began. Some people love the look of the church, while others deride it as the church's pajamas. The main entrance of the church is an impressive sight in its own right. With Giotto's bell tower to one side, it's worth taking a few minutes to stand and take in the details. Once you've had your fill of the facade, turn on your heels 180 degrees and you'll be greeted by the octagonal baptistry and Ghiberti's bronze doors. These doors are facsimiles of the original, with the real doors currently residing in the Duomo Museum. Lorenzo Ghiberti took 27 years to sculpt these iconic doors, known as the Gates of Paradise. They represent some of the earliest works of Renaissance sculpture able to demonstrate three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional plane. They show a mastery of perspective and depth, making these both a mathematical and artistic display of beauty. From the Duomo, we take a leisurely stroll to the Palazzo Vecchio. So we're just standing here, literally just standing here, drinking our Chianti, eating our sandwiches. And it's amazing, we were talking about how there are so many amazing statues, just, I mean, in this one piazza alone. And you wonder, like, why, why did David become so famous? I mean, it's beautiful, but, I mean, any of these over here are unbelievable. So what about David? It's kind of like Mona Lisa. Like, why, why now? <laughs> Why this statue? Yeah, it really is amazing though. This statue of David, just like Ghiberti's bronze doors on the baptistry, is a facsimile of the original. To protect these aging, priceless works of art, they have been moved indoors and out of the elements. 
We continue our passeggiata to the Ponte Vecchio, a bridge dating back to the year 1345. Originally, this bridge was a meat market until the Medici came along and installed gold and silver shops in their place, a tradition that remains to this day. But even if jewelry is not on your souvenir list, come here anyway and soak in the iconic view of the Arno River. So we made it to Ponte Vecchio. I didn't think we would. Yeah, we, it was like Everything three minutes was so from close. Where we were. Yeah. yeah. So we decided we're like, all right, we're gonna hop over here just to say we did it. We did it. <laughs> and now we gotta go back. Well, to the and bus. it's jewelry shops, which yeah, I'm exactly. with neither which one of us. We have to go back to the bus now. We're going to get on the bus and we can go to a, a, a Tuscan castle for a wine tasting um, at a winery in Tuscan. Yeah. Cool. How cool is that? I'm very excited. <laughs> As if a day wandering around Florence wasn't amazing enough, we are now off to a charming farmhouse in Tuscany. The Castello del Trebbio estate sits on the idyllic Tuscan countryside and operates as a winery. And as if that weren't enough, it also has villas and apartments on property, just in case you want to spend more than a few hours here. And let's be honest, who doesn't want to spend more than a few hours here? We're given a tour of the wine cellar where they have both wine and olive oil, and then we're taken upstairs to the dining area where we'll get to do a tasting of some of the estate's wine. Four different wines because they own a winery here. Uh, very, very exciting. Ah, the French Riviera, La Côte d'Azur. You know the names. Nice, Monaco, Cannes. Those words conjure up images in our minds of the world's rich and famous coming to play and relax in the sun. Today we'll roam these seductive streets, visit a thriving farmer's market, and walk along the dazzling waterfront promenade. The French Riviera exudes sophistication, glamour, and elegance. Luxury yachts dot the harbor while chic boutiques line the streets. We can enjoy all this seaside tranquility while pretending that maybe just maybe, this is where we belong. At least in our heads. We're, uh, we're heading out over there, I don't know if you can see it, to Cannes, France, and then we're doing highlights of Nice tour today. You ready to go? So yeah, okay. After a short bus ride with a few stops to admire some of these spectacular views, we arrive in Nice to begin our walking tour. A short, easy walk takes us into town, along charming avenues lined with picturesque shops and ornate old-world architecture. The blue skies overhead provide the perfect backdrop for the pastel hues of the building. We walk, enjoying ourselves, until we stumble upon a beautiful local farmer's market. This farmer's market was... I don't think there's a better word for it. It was adorable. I loved it. It was so pleasant. And it was just this gorgeous day outside. I just, I absolutely loved it. <laughs> the colors of the food were extraordinary. 
reds and greens and blues and oranges and purples. Absolutely stunning. And they were covered with these red and white tents over the food. And it was just this kaleidoscope of color. It was gorgeous. The French call this area La Côte d'Azur because of the beautiful azure hue of the water. For over a century, people have flocked here to soak up the sun and walk along this wide pedestrian promenade. It is a place to see and be seen. It is seaside tranquility in the French Riviera. All right, so we are now by the sea. Look how pretty this is. When it comes to sunny Mediterranean ports, it would be hard to ignore the beckoning call of Palma de Mallorca. With an average of 300 days of sunshine each year, it is a balmy escape that also offers a plethora of history and culture. Wander through the vibrant streets and take in the smells, the sun, and snippets of conversation as you pass by open-air restaurants. The Palma Cathedral, with its flying buttresses and imposing stone facade, stands as a gothic sentinel on the skyline of the city. Palma is often called the Pearl of the Mediterranean, and when you're here, you begin to understand why. Okay, so picture it. Picture it. We're pulling in to Palma de Mallorca. And the water is so blue. It is just gorgeous. And we pull in, and there is a full rainbow all the way across the city. And it is the most gorgeous spectacle I think I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> These beautiful colors, the beautiful blue in the water, and then this full rainbow over the city. I mean, you cannot manufacture that. I was, it was stunning. My mom decided to stay on the ship because she was pretty tired today, but we all uh, decided to hop off and there's a, a cathedral here in Palma, which is right there. So we're gonna the go and- uh, still ending at the church. I know, it's still there. This rainbow is unreal. So we're gonna go uh, explore the cathedral. It's like the number one attraction here on the on the it is island. Uh, like Lacia de uh, Santa Maria. <laughs> sounds good to me. It sounds right. <laughs> Although construction technically ended on the Cathedral of Majorca in 1630. It has basically been in a state of rebuilding and reconstruction ever since the first foundations were laid in the 13th century. That's why you'll see elements of Gothic, Baroque, and even modern architecture. An earthquake in 1851 nearly spelled the demise of this cathedral until structural repair began to take place. Then, beginning in 1904, None other than Antony Gaudí, of La Sagrada Familia fame, intervened and became the architect, restoring and updating the interior of the cathedral. Something we were not able to see because... We found our way up to the cathedral and it's closed. <laughs> so uh, we're just gonna go see what we can see elsewhere, maybe get something to eat or something. They have gelato, they have other stuff here, so we're just gonna go and um, just see, what see what else we can Palma find. Has to bring. Just like that, after only a few hours, it's already time to head back to our ship. But never worry, Palma de Mallorca. Parting is such sweet sorrow, and we will certainly meet again someday. Ah, 
Paris. The mere mention of your name makes my heart beat faster. From your opulent opera house to your most magnificent museum, from your triumphal arches to your quintessential iconic tower, there is no place in the world like you. And although I am no poet, I hope you will indulge me for just a moment as I draft this letter of love touting your indefatigable beauty and utter splendor. It will undoubtedly fall short in acknowledging my admiration, but suffice it to say that I agree with the old adage, Paris is always a good idea. So we disembark from our seven night Mediterranean cruise. And as we were planning this whole trip, we thought, okay, if we're gonna fly all the way to Europe with my parents and our daughter, why not tack on four nights in Paris? And we did, and I am so glad that we did. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was November, so it wasn't super duper busy anywhere. And let's be honest, who wouldn't want to spend a little time in Paris? <laughs> Bonjour. Good morning. Bonjour. We made it to France. We're on our way right now. We just got our Paris passes and we're on our way right now to the uh, Opera House. The Opera Garnier stands as a testament of the opulence and decadence of a bygone era. Built between 1861 and 1875, it was eventually renamed for the architect behind the project, Charles Garnier. Stepping into the Palais Garnier transports one into a refined state of mind. The opera house itself is like a perfectly crafted piece of classical music. Let's call it Palais Garnier in D flat major. The first movement takes you into the lobby like a great overture. This is where you begin to hear the first notes of music. You start to hear the motifs and themes of what you're about to hear. The notes are cheerful and playful, allegro and sophisticated. Then. Building into a great crescendo, we enter into the second movement as we step into the main auditorium. We are greeted by plush, legato, red velvet seats accented with staccatos of gold. For the last 60 years, the ceiling here has been adorned with a painting by modernist painter Marc Chagall. Although initially it was not well received, it is now one of the most popular attractions on the tour. The original painted ceiling is still there, resting behind Chagall's, which was painted on panels and can be easily disassembled should they ever decide to restore the original. The third and final movement of our musical tour is the Grand Foyer, an elegantly adorned post-performance drawing room for Paris's elite society. The paintings that surround the room depict assorted moments in music history. As much as I enjoy walking through this area, I just have to say, I kind of wish they'd use more gold. It's very dark, so we can't really see much, but my uh, mom and dad and I are gonna go do a river cruise, uh, assuming we get there on time, because we're cutting it a little close. But if we get there on time, we're gonna go do a Sin river cruise. Jess is staying in the room um, with Gigi, because Gigi's been going, 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 and so we're like, you know what? She deserves a little break. She's just gonna hang out in the apartment. <laughs> Our late night cruise along the Seine begins and ends at the Eiffel Tower, so we have amazing views as we leave and as we return. Our boat slowly meanders within the banks of this glorious, historic waterway, under bridges and past buildings that look like they could be a set for Les Miserables. The light from the streets lazily bounces off the ripples as we leisurely float by. 
It's one of those times in your life that you simply have to pinch yourself, afraid that you may wake up and this would all be a dream. The Arc de Triomphe is easily accessible. Underground tunnels from the outer edge of the roundabout make crossing the 12 lanes of traffic a breeze. Yes, you heard me right, 12 lanes. Once across, you emerge and you can finally begin to comprehend the scale of this monument to the indomitable spirit of France. While the arch was initially commissioned by Napoleon I in 1806, it wasn't completed for 30 years after many stops and starts along the way. Since then, it has stood as one of the most iconic symbols of France. A curved stairway of 284 steps wraps its way from the ground level to the top of the monument with a few stops along the way. You made it! If you were chilly downstairs, you're uh, warmed up by now. Now you can do it, Rob. We just got this, if you can see it there, this little coin. We've been collecting them. We got one at Sagrada Familia and somewhere else, I forget. But it has a little uh, design of Paris. And we got yeah. it actually in the Arc de Triomphe right there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's so cool. So in real time, it's got this uh, movie screen here. And you can see down yeah, into the thing. I wonder if this used to be open. And then people were idiots and threw stuff down or something. And now it's a video screen. <laughs> that's very cool. See like a, uh, a full-size model here of what the statues are outside and it's just massive. Here, just stand up there so you can get a little perspective. <laughs> just the head is almost as tall as Jessica. It is, they're just massive. Very cool. All right, now we're one floor higher than where we were. Of course, there's a gift shop because classic. They've got some uh, some interesting like videos playing, showing kind of uh, some history and some information. They got a scale model over there. It's really big inside. Very cool. Once you finally emerge at the top of the monument, you will find all of Paris laid out before you. This is unbelievable. This view, all of Paris is kind of laid out. There's a lot of places in Paris where you can see, like from way up high, the entire city laid out. This is very cool though, the, uh, at the top of the Arc de Triomphe. This is neat. You can see Sacre Coeur back there. The Eiffel Tower's over there. What goes up must come down. <laughs> All right, we are back down to the bottom. Well, almost, they're almost here. Um, one thing I quickly wanted to mention though, is that this time, so we have our, uh, our Paris pass. We got the three day Paris pass. And to get into the Arc de Triomphe, we had our Paris museum pass. And all we had to do was scan the barcode on the back as we were coming in. Last night when we did our Seine River Cruise, we had to go to the ticket office and scan our thing and get a separate ticket. So just make sure you're kind of doing your research before you go. Um, but for this, all we had to do was just scan the pass that we already had. So that was nice and easy. Well, good morning. Um, so the ladies decided to stay home today, but my dad and I are going to the Louvre today. And so we just got here and uh, we decided we were still gonna go to the Louvre today because we're like, well, we could all just kind of lay low, but we we're like, no, we're in Paris. They're gonna hang out there and we're gonna go see some art. <laughs> the Louvre Museum started its life as a palace before being transformed into the largest museum in the world. This pyramid, designed by I.M. Pei and completed in 1989, serves as the main entrance into the museum.
Now, the Louvre Museum is one of, if not the most amazing museum in the entire world. It is full of beautiful, priceless works of art, none of which I am equipped to talk about. But I got all this footage while we were there, so I decided that I'll just show you all the footage I got interspersed with just a little bit of what I like to call dad history. This here horse has lost its body, but luckily he's in stable condition. This is a group of three people who do not know how to get ahead in life. This, of course, is an abstract piece. This, of course, is one of the earliest portrayals of a group of politicians. You can tell because most of them have no brains. This here is the Venus de Milo. Now, do you know what they say about the Venus de Milo? You really have to hand it to her. This is a sculpture capturing the exact moment humans first performed the whip and the nene. This here is the great, 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 great grandfather of Mr. Burt Reynolds. This is the winged victory. Now, after hearing of the death of her brother, Icarus, she decided that she would only fly indoors. Unfortunately, she flew right into a ceiling fan and lost her head. And now she's just winging it. These people here are waiting to see the Louvre's most famous exhibit, the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa, of course, was painted by Julia Roberts in 2003 as a movie poster for the hit film, Mona Lisa Smile. This gigantic art was painted by Napoleon on the day he became emperor, and amazingly enough, he painted the whole thing in just one stroke. This here is one of the earliest known posters for the musical Les Miserables. Oh, now this is an interesting piece. This is a sculpture of the exact moment that Kevin's mother realized she left him home, alone. These are Napoleon's apartments. A little known fact, this rich ornate decor was meant to offset his other shortcomings, and therefore this is known as the Napoleon Complex Apartment Complex. And of course, these are actual renderings of people laughing at these jokes. All right, we have our berets, we'll travel. <laughs> we are ready to go to the yeah. Eiffel Tower. We're gonna go up it this time yeah. and maybe grab a bite to eat. We're gonna go to all the floors, all the way to the top. Whee! We're all gonna go up to the top and see what it, see what we see. Yeah. <laughs> wow.
In our lives, we can only hope to have a few travel experiences as incredible as this. And while traveling with young ones may not be the easiest thing in the world, it is almost always worth it. The small trinkets we buy and bring home are not the real souvenirs. The memories we bring home and a new perspective on the world are the reason we travel. This trip will forever be a snapshot of a time in my life when my oldest daughter was toddling around the Colosseum, a moment with my parents at an age where we could all be together. Time is fleeting, and we must grab these moments whenever we can. I will remember the beautiful scenery, the awe-inspiring churches, the art, the captivating cities, but what I will remember with a much higher degree of fondness is the time we had together. That's why we travel to create experiences together, to earn wisdom with the people we love, and to create the memories that we will look back on for the rest of our lives.